Uh, Allah has forgiven me a little bit so I get a chance to speak to you. This has been in my head for so long. I have sent my friend on over there. And first thing, thank you, Samir, for in, like messaging me at this time, you know, to get this opportunity. Um, I don't want to take too much of it. His video is off. Oh, you don't have to be all right. All right. No, no, wait. I probably, yeah. Okay. I want to... So, he's one of the My father wants me to stay in Masjid and uh, control the manufacturing actually of the lights and products. And uh, I'm halfway contemplating to leave this place and uh, reside in Islamabad for business and work. Um, I'm definitely going to come to Pakistan for uh, to meet you, inshallah. Uh, my question is uh, regarding uh, Khurasan. Uh, Afghanistan, Iran, and Pakistan combined is also in the uh, in the past has been known as Khurasan. Now, um, at this time when Brexit is possible, and uh, that is all bogus, you know, in terms of getting the hype and the media uh, all around it before the Corona, I was thinking. Don't you think uh, Imran Khan, the Prime Minister of Pakistan, is in a position where basically the Muslim world can be known, uh, can know that these three countries collectively can be known as Khurasan because then they have, it, it will be like a marketing tool where they can actually refer back to the, uh, the Hadith and realize which direction the world is going because they made us all crazy about Brexit for the last uh, 2018 and 2019. There was a whole talk about Brexit and to the restrictions of Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Iran. And Imran Khan was already nominated to negotiate behind this. So I was thinking, do you think that is something you can, uh, you know, maybe... Uh, uh, is it haram? Is it halal? And uh, is it a good step if you can unite these three Muslim countries somehow? And okay. you know the Arab world. Is okay, I got the got the question. The uh, only comment I can offer, it's a limited comment, and that is, it would be certainly a positive development if Pakistan can establish fraternal relations with neighboring countries like Afghanistan and Iran. With Afghanistan, there has been the problem of the president, the presence of American armed forces in Afghanistan. So it's an occupied country. Uh, if the United States withdraws from Afghanistan, I don't know whether they'll do it or not. Well, then an opportunity will present itself for Pakistan. And I believe that Pakistan's foreign ministry is already well equipped. Oh, yes, they're well equipped to handle that situation. They have long experience with that. They don't need any advice from me. Yes, but uh, in respect of relations with Iran, that's a different kettle of fish. Because Pakistan has had its tail it's tail. What is tail in Urdu? Dum. 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 Ah, ji. <laughs> Pakistan ka jo dum hai na, wo ha, Saudi ka hat mein hai. The Saudis have been holding you by the tail for the longest while. <laughs> and Pakistan has been like sheep and cattle. Now, for the first time, we're seeing some intelligence entering. When MBS would have all the blood of us, Adnan Khashoggi splattered all over him. And he needed to have a bath to wash it out. What did he do? He asked Pakistan, can you do it for me? And Pakistan said, by all means. And we put the red carpet for him to come and get the shower to cleanse himself of the blood of Adnan Khashoggi. This is Pakistan's sense. This is Pakistan's wisdom. How can you afford to make stupid mistakes like these, okay? Then when Kashmir came and Pakistan slapped you, I mean, Saudi Arabia slapped you on your face, we're not going to lift our little finger for Kashmir. And then pa Saudi Arabia called Modi and gave Modi 
Saudi Arabia's highest reward, highest honor, well, then Pakistan realized, ah, yes, we have been donkeys. We have really been donkeys in our, <laughs> in our worship of Saudi Arabia. Yeah? So now we're seeing a little bit of, a little bit of intelligence coming. Just a little bit of intelligence coming. That there are things in life more valuable than U.S. dollars. That's right. There are things in life more valuable than U.S. dollars. If the relationship with Saudi Arabia was to put U.S. dollars in your pockets so your children can go and study in universities in Miami and Los Angeles, get lost. That day is gone. And so now Pakistan is withdrawing slowly from the Saudi embrace. It was the Saudi embrace that put blocks in your relationship with Iran. Because Saudi Arabia did not want Pakistan to have fraternal relations with Iran. Mm. And so now I see uh, the possibility uh, that uh, Pakistan can, can draw closer uh, to Iran. Uh, and in drawing closer to the Iran, Iran can help Pakistan to draw closer to Russia. That's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, the participant and the SAF accountant, kindly uh, unmute and ask your question. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Uh, I hope you're well. You're looking well, mashallah. Um, I wanted to keep well, my... Um... Well, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I last saw you in, in Ilford uh, in, in England, um, yeah, and you were looking well then. The is for me in Ilford. Go ahead. No, oh, mashallah. Um, you're looking well. I'm in Pakistan now, mashallah. Um, okay, uh, just wanted to keep it concise as possible, Sheikh. Um, in a nutshell, the the COVID vaccine is it the mark of the beast, which is according to the Book of Revelation, which in the Bible also mentions the war of Armageddon taking place around the Euphrates River, um, and in link with that, where we have in urban life not just a vaccine, but COVID tests and things like that, just to go about your ordinary way of, of living and travel, are they, and, and face masks and social distancing, um, is it all a mark of the beast and therefore the digital currency that the Hadith alludes to of the gold of the Euphrates that we should not touch? Because quite frankly, Sheikh, uh, as far as the West is concerned, for example, they say, the rule of six in regards to social distancing. But if you take apart the book of Revelation, it constantly refers to the number six. So just to play with English words, rule of six, shaitan's rule in, in, a, in a different uh, way and the clampdown on people's movements and everything. Like, is it that? Um, because obviously going forward, you won't be able to transact. You won't be able to live your life without this, what they call medical vaccine, if it is that. So I just wanted to get your views on that. Your name? Sir Taj. Sir Taj. Sir Taj. Sir Taj. Uh, Sir Fraz. Sir Fraz. Sir Fraz. Okay. Sir Fraz. Sir Fraz, there's one gun, one rifle. You shoot one bullet. And it goes straight to the target. But there's another one in which the bullets are scattered all over. So the destruction is greater. But you're shooting with that kind of a gun. Because... You you're asking 25 questions in one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you should use a gun to shoot one bullet at a time. The vaccine. The vaccine cannot qualify as Dabbatul Art. Dabbatul Art is the beast of the earth. We do not have the mark of the beast in our eschatology. The mark of the beast is in the Christian and Jewish eschatology, not in ours. And I don't comment on their eschatology. So in our eschatology, you have Dab Batul Art, which is the beast or the creature of the earth. And the vaccine cannot qualify for that. Why? Because Suleiman alayhi salam dies. Everybody knows he's dead and he's buried. But the jinn who are shayateen 
have been ordered by Allah in chains to work for Suleiman and if any of them were to dis disobey they would be punished with terrible punishment when he died they did not know he was dead we knew but he did, they did not know why because they're seeing him sitting on his throne and they're seeing him talking and walking and eating meaning forward and backward movement in time so they're convinced he's still alive and even as i'm speaking now they're still convinced that he's alive because there's someone sitting on his throne holding on to his step and because he's holding on to the staff there's something inside of the staff called the minsa which gives you a capacity to intervene in time and bring bring time forward and backward who is that sitting on the throne holding on to the staff it's the jasad if you don't know it you got homework to do okay i can't do your homework for you and that jasad of course is dajjal the batul ard however would come not as yet they still to come and the batul ard would attack the internal miraculous quality of the step which is called the minsa of the step which allows you if you're holding the staff to intervene in time and bring time forward and backward and so you could present suleiman alayhi still alive and walking and talking so dabatullah will destroy that internal capacity of the staff and when they do that then the jinn who are still working for the jail at this time would now be able to recognize no this is not suleiman or sitting on the throne and that's goodbye to israel on that day so what is the batul ard which has the capacity to destroy the spiritual heart of the step i have given my opinion and i can be wrong i can be wrong i have identified identified it with the electromagnetic waves which are there in 4g and 5g and 6g and so on that they have such a destructive capacity mm. that they can not only destroy the minsa of the stuff they can wipe out your children's memory mm. and you have a generation of people coming up tomorrow who has whose memory have been damaged and without memory you can't think that's my view the vaccine is not that but a lot the vaccine is being used the vaccine is being used to try to uh, to try to uh, assist them in producing people who become jasads lost the mm. capacity to think yeah mm. but i don't think the vaccine itself is that but a lot go ahead Is that okay? Is okay. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. Okay, Ahmed, uh go ahead and unmute and ask your question, please. Uh assalamu alaikum shaykh. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you. Um I've been following you since 2012, but this is this is the first time that I have a chance to um ask you a question face to face, although it's not physically Um, I'm there, but it's a pleasure to um, ask ask you a question face to face. Okay, um, I was listening to um, your recent lecture that you delivered in Islamabad maybe a, a few days ago, and you please correct me if, if I misquote you. Um, you mentioned that um, for Christians they've got their own qibla, and for us Muslims they've got our own qibla. For them, they can't move. They can't um, come to our qibla. They can't move to theirs, and their qibla and their Sharia is not. um abrogated or cancelled yet now i'm a bit confused here that if 
Christians or Jews who followed their book, which was real long time, long time before Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if that's still valid for them, and if they follow that, they'll still, I mean, be Muslims, and for us, we, we follow Quran and Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then what's the difference? What's the concept of Muslim and non-Muslim? If they do, if they follow their religion or their Qibla or their um, scriptures, and they go to heavens, we do the same, we go to heaven. Does it not um, bring the two communities um, parallel to each other or they are alternative to each other and also what's the what's the concept of muslim and non-muslim then who is the muslim yeah. and who's not muslim what so, is the please, um, shed some light the on that definition side. of a muslim let me give you the correct definition of a muslim and then tell you what the school boy says the correct definition of a muslim is someone who submits to the one god Whoever submits to the one God is a Muslim. Whoever, therefore, is in the one religion of Islam is a Muslim. Good. The schoolboy says a Muslim is limited to those who follow Prophet Muhammad. So if you're not following Prophet Muhammad, you're not a Muslim. Tell the schoolboy. Tell him for me that Islam was in the world long before Nabi Muhammad Islam was even born. All those who were living in the one religion before our Prophet was born were all Muslims. Even the Quran has said to Prophet Muhammad Islam that we have now ordered you. Oh Muhammad Ali, that you must follow the religion of Abraham, Ibrahim Ali Islam. And so Islam never came to the world for the first time with Nabi Muhammad Ali Islam. That's false. And we are not the only Muslims. No. Whoever is in the one deen of Allah is a Muslim. However, they give themselves names and this one calls himself a Jew and that one calls himself a Christian. Okay? Now then, when Nabi Isa al-Islam is to return, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about his followers, people who follow him are not following Nabi Muhammad al-Islam. No. Allah says that those who follow Jesus will be raised by Allah to a position of dominance. And when they are raised to that position of dominance, they will remain there until the end of the world. Is that in the Quran? Are you aware? Yes. 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 That is in the Quran. So they will still be in the one religion, but they will not be followers of Nabi Muhammad They would still be in Islam, but they would not be in the Ummah of Nabi Muhammad So they would be Muslims who will be following Jesus. and not be in the Ummah of Muhammad and they'll be the dominant force in the world. I hope you will check, check out my books in which I've explained the subject, okay? Next. Akib Mirza, go ahead, please. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Can you hear me, Akib Mirza? Yes, we was with you in England. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, yes, yes. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. I'm uh, from England, uh, Hamim Foundation, along with the Faisal. Which, Hamim Foundation. I'm asking you a which question. City? Which, which city? Uh, 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 which city? I'm from Lahore right now. I moved from uh, England to Lahore last uh, September. Oh, you're in Lahore now? Very good. Yes, I'm Lahore now. Yeah, being, keep remaining. 
Congratulations. Yeah. I'm coming to Lahore to eat some mangoes, inshallah, after eat. Inshallah, yeah. I was willing to come uh, to Islamabad, then uh, uh, Sami said that it's I'm being cancelled. Yeah, yeah. All right. Um, Sheikh, uh, my question is a recent event in Pakistan about the blessing. Uh, can you hear me? Hakim, yes, go ahead. Hakim. 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 Yeah, go ahead. Hakim. Yeah. Uh, my uh, question is about the recent situation in Pakistan about the blasphemy issue from the France here. Yeah? How do the nation have to tackle it peacefully or tactfully? A people have the right to differ with the government. If you are denied the right to differ with your government, you're living in a dictatorship. Hmm. If people have the right to marshal their resources to resist a government policy which they differ, they have the right to do that once there is freedom. But the religion of Islam never gives you the permission to destroy people's property. So if they are on this road and they're destroying people's property, they're not following Prophet Muhammad, they're following Iblis, they're following Shaitan. Someone should tell them that. And that's what they're doing. They're destroying people's property. They're killing people. They believe that they have the right to, 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 to demonstrate in this way. Why can't you demonstrate peacefully? We demonstrated in Mecca. Yes. But we did it peacefully. When they attack us, we have the right to resist. And if we cannot, we make hijra. But when we demonstrate, we do it peacefully. That is the sunnah. We don't, we don't demonstrate with violence, breaking up all the shops and, and the roads of Medina and Mecca. We didn't do that. That's their sunnah, and this is our sunnah. So tell them they're doing it the wrong way. They have the right to demonstrate, but they must demonstrate without destroying people's property. Uh, thank you so much. Okay. okay. Uh, there is a user by the name of Galaxy J7. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know your name. So kindly unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Galaxy J7, please unmute yourself. Assalamu alaikum, my chef. Wa alaikum. My name is Samuel. Uh, Samiullah, Samiullah Khan. Samiullah Khan. Yeah, I'm Pakistani born and grew up in uh, Switzerland uh, and I do live in, in a nearby tribal area near Afghanistan. It's called Waziristan. Near Afghanistan. Yeah, nearby Afghanistan. It's, uh, okay. it's a tribal area. I'm coming it's to Peshawar. Kal ah, we coming to you Peshawar are coming here. Tomorrow, inshallah, yeah. Inshallah, I'm waiting to you because I'm in contact with Samir. Very good. Very so good. I'm in inshallah, inshallah. All right, good. Uh, I, I grew up in Switzerland, in Zurich. I, lose, I do live there and live I'm following Zurich. you. Yeah, in Zurich. I live in Zurich. And, I uh, I was in Zurich maybe about two months ago. <laughs> I was in Oh, Zurich. yeah. No, about north of Zurich, about maybe 45 minutes north of Zurich. I was there about okay. two months ago. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, mashallah. Actually, I'm following your lectures uh, since almost 10 years, and uh, I'm really blessed to, to have you. And uh, I moved back to Pakistan since last year and uh, following your footsteps. So since uh, you said that uh, in some lecture that uh, in Surah Al-Baqarah that uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has uh, created uh, mankind as like wajalna uh, fil ardi khalifa. So referring to this point, uh, since in my area it's, it's strategically also important from the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but uh, public opinion and uh, normal people here doesn't know about uh, the way you teach us the uh, Islamic explanation about the eschatology. So my uh, struggle is to, to, uh, 
to have your advice on this respect, how to go ahead with uh, your food steps and how to preach you know, uh, your methodology to the public. Is it a good way to, to, to do on social media, to have open on some institute or what kind of, I can do that? Okay. Because I'm living in Pakistan now. Yeah, my view, based on my Islamic eschatology, yeah. is that the Khilafah state will be restored only when Imam al-Mahdi emerges, not before. But those like Hizbut Tahrir, who differ with me, unlike ISIS, you know, the CIA operation called ISIS, yeah, uh, who differ with me and believe they can establish the Khilafah state, I say, go ahead, I'm not stopping you, go ahead. But I am of the opinion that it is not possible to establish, establish a Khilafah state until Imam al-Mahdi comes. Why? Because Gog and Magog are created by Allah and they have irresistible power. Only Allah can destroy them. And they are the ones who control power in the world today. Iqbal realized that. My teacher realized that. I realized that. But the rest don't realize that. The rest believe that Gog and Magog will only come at that time when Nabi Isa al-Islam returns and he kills Dajjal. So I say, go ahead, stay with your views. I'm moving on. Okay, mashallah. But Sheikh, my question was that uh, how can we, you know, convince people here? How can we go with your footsteps to, to the public here? I mean, at least to but we have get a to for this. Prepare the way for the Khilafah state. Okay. Preparing it means removing all the brainwashing that has taken place. And uh, Iqbal has contributed it to it. Iqbal made a mistake. Nobody would agree with Iqbal today. Nobody. We, he didn't say it in Urdu or in Farsi. He said it in English. That's why it had such a profound impact on the, on the establishment. He said that the re modern Republican state is an adequate substitute for the Khilafah. Nobody would agree with him today, all right? So Iqbal made a mistake, but if Iqbal was alive today, he'd be the first to say, yes, I, I was wrong, okay? We all make mistakes, but that does not mean Iqbal is not a great scholar. The re modern Republican state has taken, the, taken over the thinking of people around the world that this is a valid substitute we don't need to return to the Khilafah state. Pakistan has come to stay, and we are comfortable with Pakistan. Okay? What you have to do is you have to remove this brainwashing. And you can only do it with the Quran, and that is what I'm doing. And if you use my books and use my lectures, that should help you in your effort, yeah. Okay, Sheikh Imran, we have a question on Russia. We have two questions. Go ahead. The first is, what's your comment regarding the Russian foreign minister's visit to Pakistan? And the second is, um, what will be the role or reaction of Russia during Pax Judaica? Uh, whoever asked this, these two questions were the very intelligent questions, and I am happy that you asked them. Uh, first of all, I, I, um, I was too busy traveling, and I couldn't pay attention to the Russian foreign minister's visit to Pakistan. So I don't know uh, how it transpired. I don't know what were the results of it and so on. But I say, Pakistan, you are very, very, very lucky that, that the Russian foreign minister even came to Pakistan. Why? The answer is because Russia for many, cent for many decades was oppressed by the Soviet Union and by communism. The Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. And uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed and walked away, communism left, Russia 
immediately began to return to her spiritual heart to the orthodox christian spiritual heart and within a short period of time russia recovered its profile as an orthodox christian state rather than as a marxist state and hagia sophia is very 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 dear to the heart of russia what the Soviet, what the ottoman empire did shamefully, disgracefully, and manifestly sinfully, and my words are like thunder, to take Hagia Sophia and transform it into a masjid. You have to have the brains of a donkey to believe that you're allowed to do that. Only donkeys will say you can take the Christian cathedral and you allowed in Islam to transform it into a masjid. You are a donkey. No, no, no. You can't do that. The Quran prohibits you. And so the Ottoman Empire was sabotaging the friendly relations between Muslims and Orthodox Christians for 600 years, 600 years. And now when Erdogan wanted to drive another daggers deep down into the heart of the Orthodox Christian world, he took Hagia Sophia and transformed it to do a masjid one more time. Slapped Russia in the face. And guess what Pakistan did? That's right. Not just the government of Pakistan, the whole country, without thinking like sheep and cattle, applauding Erdogan, happy that the masjid, that the, church, the cathedral is once again a masjid. What can I do for a people who cannot think? Iqbal said about this ummah. He said, this woman stopped thinking 500 years ago. I have come to Pakistan to speak plainly, boldly, to say to you, you made a mountain of a mistake. You made a mountain of a mistake by following Erdogan and supporting the taking of Hagia Sophia and transforming it into a masjid. In Pakistan, you made a big, big mistake. So you're lucky that the foreign minister of Russia came to Pakistan. However, Russia is good at doing business like China. So Russia will be happy to do business with Pakistan. That's not a problem. You want weapons? Russia will sell you weapons. You want natural gas? Russia will sell it to you. But on that day when Pakistan is attacked and you want to turn to Russia for help? No, Russia is not going to help you. Not when you slap Russia on their face. No. So my answer to you is that the visit of the Russian foreign minister is a plus. Pakistan, you should be lucky. You should consider yourself lucky that he came. And the role of Russia in world affairs to come, in particular with reference to Pakistan, unless and until Pakistan can take steps to correct this mountain of a mistakes you're making, there's no way that you can count on Russia to, help, to be a strategic partner to help you on the day when the chips are down. Okay, Sheikh, are we ready for the next question? Uh, there is a user by the name of Zuno Rain Shah, and he or she, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know if it's a brother or sister, asks um, regarding, is Bitcoin haram? And if so, will this cryptocurrency be the new method of monetary system, which Israel will use to become a superpower and replace the US dollar? I am not at all happy 
with people who do not do their homework. You have been teaching the subject of money for 25 years now. All the information is there in my public lectures, it's there in my books. All you have to do is read it and you come to ask me a question which has been answered for so many times already. I can only offer you a minute in response. That when you go to the Quran, recognizing the Quran to be absolute truth, to locate what is money in the Quran. And when you go to the Sunnah, you find a definition of money. That in order for money to be halal, money must have intrinsic value, meaning that the value of the money must be in the money. Dinar and dirham, money with intrinsic value. Those who brought this rival system of money into the world, meaning modern Western civilization, they knew that this is bogus money. They knew that this money cannot survive if real money in the market. So in the Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund, they have prohibited the use of gold as money. And guess what Pakistan did? Hmm? Well, guess what Pakistan did? Pakistan ignored the Quran. Pakistan took the Quran and put it aside. Pakistan never went into the Quran to locate guidance. And Pakistan accepted. It is so sad accepted the Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund, which prohibits the use of, money, of gold as money. If Allah has made something halal and someone makes it haram, what sin is that? Even a schoolboy knows that that is shirk. And Allah will not forgive shirk. Well, Allah made gold halal, halal as money, dinar and dirham as money. And the International Monetary Fund made it haram. Instead of Pakistan remaining faithful to the Quran, Pakistan betrayed the Quran. Don't tell me everybody else did it. Is that an answer from a sensible person? That is not the answer I expect from you. The answer I expect from you is that if we have betrayed the Quran, then integrity and honesty is that we should say, yes, we have betrayed the Quran. Don't hide behind the rest of the world saying everybody else is doing it. No, be honest for once in your life and say, yes, we betrayed the Quran. Be honest and say so. That Allah made it halal and the International Monetary Fund made it haram and we accepted the International Monetary Fund. That is what I expect. The answer from people who are honest. If this is the truth, then what do you do? You have to recognize that all this money that they have given us paper money, plastic money, electronic money, petrodollar, cryptocurrency, bit, Bitcoin, and the one universal currency which is coming tomorrow. All of this is bogus. All of this is fraudulent. And all of this is haram. But the Jamaat Islami, which was led by Karthi Hussein Ahmad, this says, yes, we recognize it's doka. But we can't say it's haram. The Tanzim Islami led by Dr. Isra Rahmad Rahimahullah. They agree that this is bogus. No, no, we can't say it's haram. Until Mufti says it's haram. So I say to them, stay where you are. You were like this for 30 years. You'll be like this for another 30 years. Stunk, stuck in concrete. Stuck in concrete. You cannot differ with Mufti. 
What's wrong? Mufti is wrong. This is haram money. Unless you say it's haram, how could you get out of it? So my answer to you is, I have already taught the subject of what is money. I've done it for 25 years now. Please read my books and listen to my lectures. Thank you. Okay. We have a um, question from Irfan Sheikh. Um, Irfan, ask, um, uh, sorry, unmute your mic and go ahead. I didn't get that. Irfan Sheikh. Irfan, 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 Irfan Sheikh, where is he? Is it fine? His video is not connected, Sheikh. Okay, fine. What's the question? Uh, Alhamdulillah, this is the first time to uh, I'm talking to you. I'm listening to your uh, lecture since uh, 2010. Now my question is, is when uh, Jesus will come, alayhi salatu uh, he will uh, break the cross and kill the pig. But I, I, I listen to the hadith. Uh, um, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa says, the alcohol is the umul khabais. Why is not pro prohibiting the uh, privileges of alcohol? instead of uh, uh, break, uh, break the cross or kill the pig. Good. Um, is absolute truth located in the Quran, Irfan Sahib? I'm asking a question. I'm not hearing an answer. One second, Shri. I think he's muted. Irfan, unmute your mic, please. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Irfan. Absolute truth, al haqqul yakin. Absolute truth. Is it not located in the Quran, Irfan? Sir? Uh, I uh, actually I check uh, check in uh, Quran and Quran. Uh, I found uh, this is a haram. Uh, you're not answering my question. All right, let me answer it for you. Sorry. <laughs> the Quran says, Irfan Sahab, that absolute truth is located in the Quran. The Quran and the Quran alone is al haqqul yakin. Absolute truth is not located in the Hadith. No, only in the Quran. Mm -hmm. Number two, the Quran is protected by Allah. You know that. So no one can change the Quran. But is the Hadith protected by Allah? No, Irfan Sahib, you know the answer. I can answer for you. Okay? And Allah tells us he wants us to use the Quran. He says use the Quran to wage a mighty jihad against all the rivals of truth. So it is the Quran we must turn to first of all for guidance, not the Hadith. Okay? If you want me to discuss the subject based on the Quran, I'm happy to do that. But I am not going to the Hadith, first of all, at all. If I do that, I'll be a fool. I have to go to the Quran first. And when I go to the Quran and I establish what is in the Quran, then we go to the Hadith. And if any Hadith is in harmony with the Quran, alhamdulillah. But when we find a hadith in conflict with the Quran, what do you want me to do? Huh? If a hadith is in conflict with the Quran, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll stay with the Quran. If anybody wants to stay with the hadith, let them stay. Don't ask me questions. Okay? Now, Nabi Isa Islam will return to the world. That's in the Quran. And when he comes back to this world, he's coming to rule the world, rule the world, okay? But when he comes, Nabi uh, Isa al-Islam comes, Imam al-Mahdi would already be here. So can you have Nabi Isa al-Islam ruling the world and Imam al-Mahdi also ruling the world? <laughs> Where did that nonsense come from? No, this is Nabi, that is Imam. <laughs> and the Nabi will be ruling the world from Jerusalem. Imam al-Mahdi is not going to be ruling anything from Jerusalem at all. 
Nabi Isa alayhi salam will rule the world from Jerusalem. He would be al-hakimul adil, the just ruler, said Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, ruling the world from Jerusalem. And he will have a khilafah state in Jerusalem. Who are those who will be following Nabi Nabi Isa alayhi salam. Let me repeat the question. Who are those who will follow Nabi Isa alayhi salam? I'll tell you for me, I am not following him. I follow a man named Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. I don't know for you. And I don't know for the sheep and the cattle. I know for myself. I follow Nabi Muhammad I don't follow Nabi Isa No, I follow Nabi Muhammad. So who are those who will be following when he returns? And Allah says about them in the Quran that Allah is going to raise them to a position in dominance and they remain in that position of dominance until the end of the world. Is it not time for our people to take a shower and wash away all this brainwashing that, that the followers of Nabi Muhammad are going to rule the world? And Imam al-Mahdi is going to rule the world where this nonsense came from. Where did this nonsense come from? It certainly didn't come from the Quran. I don't know where it came from. Uh, my brother Irfan, uh, it's a complex subject, but you need to do your homework. And you have to go to the Quran first of all and locate truth that is in the Quran. And when you go to the Quran, you must not go with pre preconceived ideas. No. Let your mind be free. And whatever is in the Quran, you submit to it. Whether you understand it, you don't, you sub submit. Whether you're comfortable with it or not, submit to the Quran. And only after that, doing that, only then you turn to the Hadith. And when you see a Hadith which is in harmony with the Quran, you accept it. But when you find hadiths which are in conflict with the Quran, no, stay with the Quran. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have a question from Waqas Ahmed. Waqas, go ahead and unmute your mic, please. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, Waqas. How are you? I'm fine, Alhamdulillah. Sheikh, I'm from Mansehra. Basically, it's uh, north of Pakistan. Mansehra. Uh, I'll not, yeah, I will not How waste your time. You I will ask the question straight. Sorry? How far are you from Peshawar? Peshawar, it's like three hours. Uh, okay. okay. Closer right. from here. Then. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So you are always welcome. If you want to come, I mean, uh, it's a very fine road and you can easily I mean, come. I'm, co I'm coming to Peshawar, inshallah, tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, inshallah. Inshallah. Okay, I will ask the uh, questions uh, straight instead of wasting the time. Uh, my first question is uh, like... Uh, Any questions you are, can ask? Uh, oh. They are the three questions, but they are very small questions. questions. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Please ask one at this time, only one. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, uh, I will uh, ask the last one. I mean, that's yeah. the most important. Uh, in, uh, in the last lecture or uh, the lecture before the last lecture, you told about, uh, I mean, the methodology of recitation of Quran. Uh, yeah. You asked that uh, there was a specific statement that you have to study the Quran as you study the stars. Now, the thing I'll is that we are star. already... Sitaro uh, yes. is there? Go ahead. Yes, exactly. So uh, now my question is that uh, we are already uh, away from the study of stars and uh, the Darul Loom and the Ulma and the, especially the Biryani Ulma. They did a lot of work in that. <laughs> okay. okay, you made me laugh. <laughs> so uh, my question is that. Uh, 
to study Quran, uh, how can we study the stars? I mean, is there any suggestion? Is there any book or is there any lectures? No, no, you don't need. You don't need to go and study the stars. You just need to accept the methodology that if you want to navigate a ship in the ocean, Allah says in the Quran, Ba'dahuzi billahi min ash-shaytani rajim. He says, Wa bin najmi hum yahatadun. That they locate direction from the stars. That they locate direction from the stars. <coughs> In order to locate direction from the stars, you've got to be able to read the stars. Reading the stars means you have to understand how the stars are interconnected with each other. And those interconnections form patterns. And when you recognize a pattern, it facilitates your capacity to locate direction. That's all. Now, when this methodology is applied to the Quran, this is called Usul Tafsir. Tafsir mm -hmm. means explanation. Usul Tafsir means methodology for study of the Quran. So when you apply this methodology to the Quran, you will now realize that you cannot study a single verse of the Quran by itself, stand alone, to get meaning. No, it's the same way you can't look at one star. You've got to see how the star, the verses of the Quran are interconnected with each other. And in studying those interconnections, you've got to look for patterns. For example, a pattern which emerges from the Quran pertaining to the subject of Dajjal. Okay? When you have done that, then you can get guidance from the Quran, you can get direction from the Quran. But secondly, the Quran is comprised of two kinds of <clears throat> verses. You have those verses which are plain and clear. They're called Ayat Muhkamat. And you also have those verses which need to be interpreted. Ayat mutashabihat. So it's a complex, complex thing to be able to take from the ayat muhkamat and from the ayat mutashabihat and locate a pattern from which you can now derive meaning. My teacher, blessed memory, Maulana Dr. Muhammad Fadl Rahman Ansari, has written a wonderful book, The Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society. The most important thing he has given in that book is the methodology for the study of the Quran. Uh, but the book is so complex, difficult for people to read it. So I had to write another book in which I simplified what my teacher has written. And my book is entitled uh, The Methodology for the Study of the Quran, but I'm changing the title now. The new title is The Quran and the Stars, Methodology for Study of the Quran. And this book will be alongside the other book, The Quran and the Moon, Methodology for Recitation of the Quran. These two books are like sisters, they form a pair. So please read these two books. Okay. All right. Next question. Uh, Sheikh, one uh, last question. Um, is there a hadith that refers to running to the mountains obligatory? And uh, is, is, this a, is this hadith a long one, uh, which has last option? No, there is no obligation. When Allah's messenger gives us advice, <laughs> if you choose to accept it, alhamdulillah. And if you choose to reject his advice, then you live with the implications of your rejection. He said the time will come when a believer, in order to preserve his faith, would have to flee to the mountainsides and places where rain falls. 
already I am alive in a world in which any masjid I go to, the salat is bogus. Any masjid I go to, the salat is bogus. I have to search to find a masjid where we can stand up in salat without having to put on a face mask and without having social distancing. When you cannot find any masjid like that, none, what do you do? Answer, you'll be a fool to continue living amongst those people. No, leave them with their bogus salat and go search in the mountain sides, places where rain falls, where you can take your religion with you and live with it. And there in the remote countryside, in small communities, you can stand up and perform salat, the valid way, not the bogus way. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. You said it was the last question, eh? Yes, sir. Good, fine. So do you have any closing remarks? Because we're finishing now. No, this is not the last time. We'll have more of this. <laughs> okay, inshallah. Yeah.